Wales in the early Middle Ages covers the time between the Roman departure from Wales c. 383 and the rise of Murfenfrike to the throne of Gwynedd c. 825. In that time there was a gradual consolidation of power into increasingly hierarchical kingdoms. The end of the early Middle Ages was the time that the Welsh language transitioned from the primitive Welsh spoken throughout the era into Old Welsh, and the time when the modern Anglo-Welsh border would take its near final form, a line broadly followed by Offa's Dyke, a late 8th century earthwork. Successful unification into something recognisable as a Welsh state would come in the next era under the descendants of Murph and Brick. Wales was rural throughout the era, characterised by small settlements called Treffer. The local landscape was controlled by a local aristocracy and ruled by a warrior aristocrat. Control was exerted over a piece of land and, by extension, over the people who lived on that land. Many of the people were tenant peasants or slaves, answerable to the aristocrat who controlled the land on which they lived. There was no sense of a coherent tribe of people and everyone, from ruler down to slave, was defined in terms of his or her kindred family and individual status. Christianity had been introduced in the Roman era, and the Britons living in and near Wales were Christian throughout the era. The semi-legendary founding of Gwynedd in the 5th century was followed by internecine warfare in Wales and with the kindred Brythonic kingdoms of northern England and southern Scotland and structural and linguistic divergence from the southwestern peninsula British kingdom of Dumnonion known to the Welsh as Cerny prior to its eventual absorption into Wessex. The 7th and 8th centuries were characterised by ongoing warfare by the northern and eastern Welsh kingdoms against the intruding Anglo-Saxon kingdoms of Northumbria and Mercia. That era of struggle saw the Welsh adopt their modern name for themselves, Cymru, meaning fellow countrymen, and it also saw the demise of all but one of the kindred kingdoms of northern England and southern Scotland at the hands of then ascendant Northumbria. Geography The total area of Wales is 20,779 square kilometres, or 9% of the area of Great Britain. Much of the landscape is mountainous with treeless moors and heath, and having large areas with peat deposits. There is approximately 1,200 kilometres of coastline and some 50 offshore islands, the largest of which is Anglesey. The present climate is wet and maritime, with warm summers and mild winters, much like the later medieval climate though there was a significant change to cooler and much wetter conditions in the early part of the era. The southeastern coast was originally a wetland, but reclamation has been ongoing since the Roman era. There are deposits of gold, copper, lead, silver and zinc, and these have been exploited since the Iron Age, especially so in the Roman era. In the Roman era some granite was quarried, as was slate in the north and sandstone in the east and south. Native fauna included large and small mammals, such as the brown bear, wolf, wildcat, rodents, several species of weasel, and shrews, voles and many species of bat. There were many species of birds, fish and shellfish. The early medieval human population has always been considered relatively low in comparison to England but efforts to reliably quantify it have yet to provide widely acceptable results. Subsistence Much of the arable land is in the south, southeast, southwest, on Anglesey, and along the coast. However, specifying the ancient usage of land is problematic in that there is little surviving evidence on which to base the estimates. Forest clearance has taken place since the Iron Age, and it is not known how the ancient people of Wales determined the best use of the land for their particular circumstances, such as in their preference for wheat, oats, rye or barley depending on rainfall, growing season, temperature and the characteristics of the land on which they lived. Anglesey is the exception, historically producing more grain than any other part of Wales. Animal husbandry included the raising of cattle, pigs, sheep and a lesser number of goats. Oxen were kept for ploughing, asses for beasts of burden and horses for human transport. 
The importance of sheep was less than in later centuries, as their extensive grazing in the uplands did not begin until the 13th century. The animals were tended by swineherds and herdsmen, but they were not confined, even in the lowlands. Instead open land was used for feeding, and seasonal transhumance was practiced. In addition, bees were kept for the production of honey. Society Kindred family The importance of blood relationships, particularly in relation to birth and noble descent, was heavily stressed in medieval Wales. Claims of dynastic legitimacy rested on it, and an extensive patrilinear genealogy was used to assess fines and penalties under Welsh law. Different degrees of blood relationship were important for different circumstances, all based upon the Sendal. The nuclear family was especially important, while the Pensendal held special status, representing the family in transactions and having certain unique privileges under the law. Under extraordinary circumstances the genealogical interest could be stretched quite far. For the serious matter of homicide, all of the fifth cousins of a kindred were ultimately liable for satisfying any penalty. Land and political entities the Welsh refer to themselves in terms of their territory and not in the sense of a tribe. Thus there was Gwenhoas and Gwyr Gwensi and Brosiniac. Welsh custom contrasted with many Irish and Anglo-Saxon contexts where the territory was named for the people living there. This is aside from the origin of a territory's name, such as in the custom of attributing it to an eponymous founder. The Welsh term for a political entity was GW Ladum. It expressed the notion of a sphere of rule with a territorial component. The Latin equivalent seems to be regnum, which referred to the changeable, expandable, contractable sphere of any ruler's power. Rule tended to be defined in relation to a territory that might be held and protected, or expanded or contracted. Though the territories themselves were specific pieces of land and not synonyms for the GW lad, Throughout the Middle Ages the Welsh used a variety of words for rulers, with the specific words used varying over time, and with literary sources generally using different terms than analytic ones. Latin language texts used Latin language terms while vernacular texts used Welsh terms. Not only did the specific terms vary, the meaning of those specific terms varied over time as well. For example, Brennan was one of the terms used for a king in the 12th century. The earlier, original meaning of Brennan was simply a person of status. Kings are sometimes described as over kings, but the definition of what that meant is unclear, whether referring to a king with definite powers, or to ideas of someone considered to have high status. Kingship Wales in the early Middle Ages was a society with a landed warrior aristocracy, and after c. 500 Welsh politics were dominated by kings with territorial kingdoms. The legitimacy of the kingship was of paramount importance, the legitimate attainment of power was by dynastic inheritance or military proficiency. A king had to be considered effective and be associated with wealth, either his own or by distributing it to others and those considered to be at the top level were required to have wisdom, perfection, and a long reach. Literary sources stress martial qualities such as military capability, bold horsemanship, leadership, the ability to extend boundaries and to make conquests, along with an association with wealth and generosity. Clerical sources stressed obligations such as respect for Christian principles, providing defense and protection pursuing thieves and imprisoning offenders, persecuting evildoers, and making judgments. The relationship among people that is most appropriate to the warrior aristocracy is clientship and flexibility, and not one of sovereignty or absolute power, nor necessarily of long duration. Prior to the 10th century power was held on a local level, and the limits of that power varied by region. There were at least two restraints on the limits of power, the combined will of the ruler's people, and the authority of the Christian church. There is little to explain the meaning of subject, beyond noting that those under a ruler owed an assessment and military service when demanded. 
while they were owed protection by the ruler. Kings For much of the early medieval period kings had few functions except military ones. Kings made war and gave judgments but they did not govern in any sense of that word. From the 6th to the 11th centuries the king moved about with an armed, mounted war band, a personal military retinue called a Tulu that is described as a small, swift-moving, and close-knit group. This military elite formed the core of any larger army that might be assembled. The relationships among the king and the members of his war band were personal, and the practice of fosterage strengthened those personal bonds. Aristocracy power was held at a local level by families who controlled the land and the people who lived on that land. They are differentiated legally by having a higher sahid than the general populace, by the records of their transactions, by their participation in local judgments and administration, and by their consultative role in judgments made by the king. References to the social stratification that defines an aristocracy are widely found in Welsh literature and law. A man's privilege was assessed in terms of his brain, of which there were two kinds, and in terms of his superior's importance. Two men might each be an uchel, but a king is higher than a bray, so legal compensation for the loss to a king's bondsman was higher than the equivalent loss to the bondsman of a bray. Early sources stressed birth and function as the determinators of nobility, and not by the factor of wealth that later became associated with an aristocracy. Populous The populace included a hereditary tenant peasantry who were not slaves or serfs, but were less than free. GWAs referred to a dependent in perpetual servitude, but who was not bound to labor service. Nor can the person be considered a vassal except perhaps as a clerical self-description, as in the vassal of a saint. The early existence of the concept suggests a stratum of bound dependence in the post-Roman era. The proportion of the medieval population that consisted of freemen or free peasant proprietors is undetermined, even for the pre-conquest period. Slavery existed in Wales as it did elsewhere throughout the era. Slaves were in the bottom stratum of society, with hereditary slavery more common than penal slavery. Slaves might form part of the payment in a transaction made between those of higher rank. It was possible for them to buy their freedom, and an example of manumission at Landalo Vower is given in a 9th century marginalia note of the Lichfield Gospels. Their relative numbers is a matter of guess and conjecture. Christianity The religious culture of Wales was overwhelmingly Christian in the early Middle Ages. Pastoral care of the laity was necessarily rural in Wales, as it was in other Celtic regions. In Wales the clergy consisted of monks, orders and non-monastic clergy, all appearing in different periods and in different contexts. There were three major orders consisting of bishops, priests and deacons, as well as several minor ones. Bishops had some temporal authority, but not necessarily in the sense of a full diocese. Communities monasticism is known in Britain in the 5th century though its origins are obscure. The church seemed episcopally dominated and largely consisting of monasteries. The size of the religious communities is unknown. The different communities were preeminent within small spheres of influence. The known sites are mostly coastal, situated on good land. There are passing references to monks and monasteries in the 6th century. From the 7th century onward there are few references to monks but more frequent references to disciples. Institutions Archaeological evidence consists partly of the ruined remains of institutions, and in finds of inscriptions and the long cist burials that are characteristic of post-Roman Christian Britons. The records of transactions and legal references provide information on the status of the clergy and its institutions. Landed proprietorship was the basis of support and income for all clerical communities, exploiting agriculture, herding, infrastructure, and employing stewards to supervise the labor. Lands that were not adjacent to the communities provided income in the form of a business of landlordship. Lands under clerical proprietorship were exempt from the fiscal demands of kings and secular lords. They had the power of Nordum Nodua. 
clerical power was moral and spiritual, and this was sufficient to enforce recognition of their status and to demand compensation for any infringement on their rights and privileges. History Saints Bede's Ecclesiastic History The notion of a separate Anglo-Saxon and British approach to Christianity dates back at least to Bede. He portrayed the Synod of Whitby as a set-piece battle between competing Celtic and Roman religious interests. While the Synod was an important event in the history of England and brought finality to several issues in Anglo-Saxon Britain, Bede probably overemphasized its significance so as to stress the unity of the English Church. Bede's characterization of St. Augustine's meeting with seven British bishops and the monks of Bangor as co-ed portrays the Bishop of Canterbury as chosen by Rome to lead in Britain, while portraying the British clergy as being in opposition to Rome. He then adds a prophecy that the British church would be destroyed. His apocryphal prophecy of destruction is quickly fulfilled by the massacre of the Christian monks at Bangor as co-ed by the Northumbrians. Shortly after the meeting with St. Augustine, Bede describes the massacre immediately following his delivery of the prophecy, Celtic versus Roman myth one consequence of the Protestant Reformation and subsequent ethnic and religious discord in Britain and Ireland was the promotion of the idea of a Celtic church that was different from in at odds with the Roman church and that held to certain offensive customs, especially in the dating of Easter, the tonsure, and the liturgy. Scholars have noted the partisan motives and inaccuracy of the characterization, as has the Catholic Encyclopedia, which also explains that the Britons using the Celtic Rite in the early Middle Ages were in communion with Rome, Cymru. The early Middle Ages saw the creation and adoption of the modern Welsh name for themselves, Cymru, a word descended from the Brythonic Combrogi, meaning fellow countrymen. It appears in Moli and Cadwallon, a poem written by Cadwallon ap Cadfornes Bard af Fairthig c. 633, and probably came into use a self-description before the 7th century. Historically the word applies to both the Welsh and the Brythonic-speaking peoples of Northern England and Southern Scotland, the peoples of the Old North, and emphasizes a perception that the Welsh and the men of the North were one people, exclusive of all others. Universal acceptance of the term as the preferred written one came slowly in Wales, eventually supplanting the earlier Brython or Britons. The term was not applied to the Cornish or the Breton peoples, who share a similar heritage, culture and language with the Welsh and the men of the North. All of the Cymru shared a similar language, culture and heritage. Their histories are stories of warrior kings waging war, and they are intertwined in a way that is independent of physical location, in no way dissimilar to the way that the histories of neighbouring Gwynedd and Powys are intertwined. Kings of Gwynedd campaigned against Brythonic opponents in the north. Sometimes the kings of different kingdoms acted in concert, as is told in the literary Why God Odin. Much of the early Welsh poetry and literature was written in the Old North by Northern Cymru. All of the northern kingdoms and people were eventually absorbed into the kingdoms of England and Scotland and their histories are now mostly a footnote in the histories of those later kingdoms, though vestiges of the Cymru past are occasionally visible. In Scotland the fragmentary remains of the laws of the Bretts and Scots show Brythonic influence, and some of these were copied into the Regum Majestatem, the oldest surviving written digest of Scots law, where can be found the gowns that is familiar to Welsh law.